thank you all for coming down closer so we could see you and feel like we're chatting with you because this is a wonderful opportunity to look at the ways in which Lisa and I span, believe it or not, almost 60 years as Navy wives. And we want to take a look at some of the many ways that things are still the same. But in some cases, there's some new wrinkles, other than the ones that I happen to have on my face. <laughs> and Lisa hasn't gained yet. Maybe 30 years from now, you'll get another chance to do yeah. this, Lisa. <laughs> so what we thought we'd do, rather than burdening Betty Ann Ryder with trying to figure out what weird and wacky people we've been for these years, that we would give you our own untarnished version of what we think our lives have been and just make that short, of, short, short and quick, and then we'll weave it in to the other parts of the discussion that we're going to give. So Lisa, you're on. Okay, so to give you a quick bio about who I am and how I came to be here, I grew up in the Buffalo area with my husband. We were high school sweethearts. And we married shortly after I graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in elementary education. And we moved here to Groton for a short period of time, and then we moved to our first duty station in Charleston, South Carolina, where I taught school for three school years, three and a half actually, and then our first child was born. And so then I went on to my, what I would call my primary career, and I became a mother, and I have six children. They range in age, age right now from 22 to eight. We have sons who are 22, 20, 17, 15, and daughters who are 10 and 8, soon to be 9 and 11. And I had uh, two of those children by myself while my husband was deployed. I had all six of those children by C-section. And so the two times my husband was deployed, I was in intensive care with children at home and um, a child and myself in intensive care. So it was definitely an adventuresome experience. Um, some people would say I should have stopped after that first experience, but I knew there were more coming. And uh, so we had our last child while my husband was deployed in command of his first submarine. Um, we have spent the majority of our career here in the Groton area, and I've been blessed to do that. My husband and I growing up in a semi-rural area outside of the city of Buffalo. This feels very much like home to us, and we've been grateful to be um, close to the water. There it was the Great Lakes, and here it's been, of course, Long Island Sound and a drivable 500 mile distance from the majority of our family. And so we've been quite grateful. Although we've also been stationed in Charleston, South Carolina and in Monterey, California and in Bremerton, Washington. Um, and we've been on both fast attacks and boomers. And my husband was a commanding officer of the USS Nebraska and also the interim commanding officer of the Memphis. So, and then the commanding officer of the base. Um, I've been very active in the community while we have been here. I right now am the president of the parent caregiver organization at the Regional Multicultural Magnet School in New London, where our children have attended school. I happen to be their foundation vice president as well, their nonprofit foundation vice president, as well as a member at large of the Community Coalition for Children. And um, I have been active in my church, teaching and leading different programs, as well as in the scouting program. We have two eagles and two eagles to come. And so that's kind of like the, the nutshell. What a nut or <laughs> nutshell. <laughs> Woo, Lisa. Absolutely overwhelming. Well, I didn't happen to grow up in Buffalo. I was an army daughter. And so I kind of grew up all over the place. In fact, when I had reached the age of 32 here in Mystic, and we were fighting the Allen Street Connector then, and trying to save the Pequot Woods, people said to me, why do you care so much? And I said, well, you know, I'm 32 years old and I have moved 24 different times and I know this is a very special place and it deserves to be preserved. So once they got past the 24 moves, they began to have a slightly different perspective, I think. Mick and I were not childhood sweethearts, but certainly when I was 15 and he was 17. So he was a year and a half older, still is actually. <laughs> and uh, we married the fall after I graduated from Smith College. And we took off for Norfolk and a nine month deployment <laughs> right away. And I was lucky enough to teach junior high in Norfolk uh, right after desegregation. So we had 400 more kids than we expected. And for a brand new teacher of eighth graders, 
that was quite the experience, where every class was 35 kids. So quite, quite the beginning. Then moved up here for sub-school and was lucky enough to land a job at Fitch High School. Um, I had had one Navy wife predecessor there who had done such a bang-up job that they decided that they would consider looking at military spouses for secondary school teachers. They had welcomed them in as elementary school, but not secondary. So you know, things have changed in, in that element a great deal since then. Uh, Mick served on five boomers, almost all out of here. One was out of Guam for a while. A boomer was a missile submarine that would be gone for three and a half months and then home for three, and you could clock your schedule of going and coming for two years hence. You knew exactly when each date was going to occur. Um, there were two crews on those submarines, about 140 sailors, and 60 to 90 wives. So that's a pretty high proportion of wives. And it began to fall to those of us who were um, senior wives that we were expected to somehow be a caretaker with little or no training to do that. And that's where being a teacher like Lisa uh, made a great deal of difference. I think it made me feel more comfortable that I could take a leadership role and keep some sanity. Um, in his first 17 years, Mick had 14 months of bona fide shore duty. Think about that. That's a lot of away time. In 1984, I became the Navy Wife of the Year. When I was called and asked to consider that, I thought, I do not want a beauty pageant. This is not my idea of, of a thing to do. And they said, no, no, no. You could make a difference. And besides that, you have to do it because you're the only person we can think of who's active in your military community and your civilian community. What they were finding was they had wonderful candidates who were doing one or the other but were not as crazy as I was to be doing both. And it did give me a wonderful platform to begin to talk about the need for support for military families, particularly submarine families. Um, and I put that to good use, I will tell you. Um, in late 75, um, we finally left command tour and moved to Arlington, Virginia, better known as the Pentagon. We had been here in this area in two different sets of clumps for a total of 11 years. Again, fairly unusual. Most of our peers were moving a lot. But Mick and I were both military kids, and we just thought the longer we can stay in one area, have maybe three submarines in a row here, which is what happened, um, that gave us more continuity. And we'll talk about housing later, but that played a role. Um, it also enabled me to do education and things like that by being here multiple tours. Um, by the early 80s, so we're leaping here a lot, we had two children there in the middle. Um, I had the grand opportunity to initiate a course at the National Defense University. Um, my husband was attending and Spouses for the first time were offered a chance to attend and it became clear that I was the only one of the spouses who wanted to attend. And so then the answer was, well, gee, we guess we really can't do that. <laughs> so I said, well, you know what? You really desperately need a course in military family research and policy and I'm the gal to teach it. And they said, yes, we think you are. And so I did that for a couple of years, and it was an interesting experience. Carried that on then to the University of Jacksonville and to Valdosta State down in, in Georgia. And then very quickly ended up coming back to this area. Was lucky enough to join the Navy Family Service Center and remain there for a decade. And I was blessed with becoming the first civilian director for the Family Service Center a job I absolutely adored. Um, 
retired in 2000 and retired from my Military Child Education Coalition Board uh, two years ago. So in two, until two years ago, I was still working formally for military families. It's been a long haul. I'm now 78 years old, I'm beginning to think maybe I ought to slow down just a little bit. So we have decided that what we'd like to do is follow Maslow's hierarchy of needs to talk about where things have been the same and where they're different. And that's a, a nice format of what your very basic needs are, which are food and shelter, safety, which often includes financial, and then your social and emotional needs. And only once all of those needs are met, and you have to go back through that, Every time the submarine leaves, every time a deployment begins, you go back through it every time you move. So you're repeating this cycle to get back to where you were. Only at that point can we as adults or can our kids as students begin to invest in their intellectual health and well-being, and then their aesthetic and their spiritual well-being. So we're going to race through those and try and fill in snippets. There's no way we could do less than a, you know, a 20-hour volume here to really handle that thoroughly. But Lisa's going to start us off with food and shelter. So <clears throat> one of the things that I know has been a problem in the past when we meet with our retired Navy wives is that there was a time here in Groton where you could not find a place to rent or to stay. And it was a really big challenge. And now with the advent of the military housing units and them being refurbished, and also with some of our major employers in the area changing and shifting their workforces, it's a little bit easier to find an accommodation that works for you and for your family. One of the things that's different about us in the Navy versus our Coast Guard friends is that the Coast Guard rotates every year in the summer, but Navy families rotate in and out all year round. And one of the biggest challenges with rotating in, in an off time, like in January or March, is for children in school. And as they get older into junior high school and high school, credits, and how do you earn a credit or complete a credit if you're going to a high school that doesn't offer that course? And so that's a whole nother ball of wax. Also, sometimes the units in housing, especially if you guys are not military and you drive by and you see these beautiful units and you think, well, why are they living in the community? Sometimes those units don't fit our needs. While my husband was the CEO of the submarine base, we did not live in the commander of the submarine base's house because the house we own and have owned for a while has five bedrooms and three full bathrooms. <laughs> and with eight people in the house, you can see why even a beautiful base house with a view of the river and two bathrooms would not be a good idea for my crowd. So we stayed where we were in a place that's a little smaller but divided up into tinier chunks and that worked for us. So you have people coming in and out at all different times of the year. You have people who are as neighbors that struggle with everyday um, tasks to maintain and upkeep their homes. Things like snow plowing, snow shoveling, leaf raking. If you've never lived a fall in New England, you cannot imagine the amount of leaf raking. No one can describe it to you until you've tried to do it once yourself. And then when someone says to you, oh yeah, and you gotta put them in those bags, you're like, what? <laughs> so you know, there are things about housing that are different and unique in each area you live in. Um, food is another big issue, you know, like if you have a comfort food and it does, they don't have it where you live, it's sometimes challenging. I know many, many, many grandmothers who come for visits with suitcases full of favorites from home and they get off the plane and their suitcase is full of whatever that favorite comfort food is from home. That's a way you can reach out to your military neighbors if you're non-military too and invite them into the things that are so unique culinarily speaking in New England, things like a lobster bake a lobster roll. Um, are you offering? Um, yes. <laughs> um, but there's just so many things that are unique. Um, soupy, if you live in Westerly, and what is that? And you know, that's how you know you've really been taken in by your neighbors when they invite you to a soupy making party. And those things are things that help people who are military and feel like they don't have a root, feel like they're rooted to this community and feel like that they are part of this community. And those are ways that you can reach out to your, non to your military neighbors if you're a non-military family and help them include them in those rituals that are unique to New England. Um, the cider press at BF Clyde's yes. and fresh cider donuts. That's something that you never get outside of New England. 
And so those are ways that can help people who don't feel at home feel at home. And Lisa and her sweet husband have a, a terrific achievement here. They have helped to issue in the new commissary, which has been an absolute godsend. For those of you who are not military, the commissary is designed to be one of our morale, welfare, and recreation benefits, that we would be able to get our food at a, at a less lesser price than perhaps you would find it on a regular basis out in town. Yes, for me it was not going to be possible to shop those circulars and go from store to store to store to get your best price because I was the girl with the two kids strapped in the in the seat and then one on my back and then another one pushing another cart and then another one pushing another cart so the the train that would go from store to store to store was really not going to work for us and the commissary really did save us a lot of logistical nightmares and a lot of um, money over time and actually if you go to the commissary now there's a spot up front for expectant mothers and for new mothers and that is there because my son Benjamin who's now 22 used to say to me mom we have all these babies and you don't get a handicap sticker? And it would be snowing and raining and we would have a newborn and I would have more intel. And so he used to say to his dad, 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 if you could ever do that, if you could ever put a spot up front for moms, that would be a good idea because you know the dads, they're gone all the time. And that was from a very young age and so that was a big day when the uh, stork spots were finally installed on the submarine base at critical junctures for those caregivers of new babies, be they mothers or fathers, with newborns that don't need to be exposed to all that to get into where they're going. Sends a wonderful message. Mm -hmm. And we also were fortunate when the new commissary opened, because there was something called the Healthy Base Initiative going on, where we were able to take, especially young families, through the commissary with the support of the dietitians up at the Navy Hospital, um, and take them through the commissary and show them ways to make more healthful food, um, more economical food, and also share with them a small gift certificate so that they could start trying some new recipes and um, changing the way they prepared food to make it more healthy. And we all know the benefit of having a family dinner even if dad isn't there. Right. And that consistency is so com important for our children. I'll just do a quick little riff on that. I shop at the commissary first, and then what I can't find, I go out and look for somewhere else. And just by doing that for how many years at this point, it has made a significant financial difference. For housing, we, we had sort of the flip experience from Lisa and Carl. When we came here to sub-school, um, Mick was actually about a month early reporting, and so we thought, oh good, we'll be at the front of the list for the nice little quarters that are on base for subschool. And the housing officer looked at us and said, I got news for you two. You're one of four couples in his class who do not have children or one on the way. So you will be living out in town. <laughs> you know, we kind of thought, that seems unfair. But six months later, when all of his classmates then graduated and wanted to go on to nuclear power school here in town, they had to leave those quarters over on the sub base. So they were all looking for apartments at the same time. And they were saying to Mick and me, gee, this is such a nice place. I wish we could find a place like this. So well, we, we sometimes did, it turns around. We did know. live in Navy housing for quite a while. And then um, we used to call it the rabbit hutch. And so when we got to like, you know, 2.3 people in every bedroom, we were like, yeah, we might need to find something else. So, <laughs> yeah. but we did enjoy it while we were the right size. Well, and I will say that I think, um, again, because we were bundling multiple tours together, we were able to remain in the same house for a protracted period of time. That let me do my favorite hobby, which is gardening. So that has been an important yes. piece for me. So now, Lisa, we should hop on into safety issues, both financial and physical safety. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll let you start that, because I want to start the next one. So. Um Physical safety in the base recently, one of the funny stories is that um, because we didn't live on the submarine base and it would snow while my husband was the base commander, he would be the person tasked with the decision, should we close? Should we open late? What should we do? 
And so we used to have these dates. And we would put all the kids to bed and leave the big kids in charge. And we would drive around the base at like midnight, one o'clock. We try to put our car in a skid. We'd go see what places were plowed. And he would get out and walk down a steep sidewalk and I would follow very slowly in the car with the headlights on before we had all the new beautiful lights on the base to try to make those decisions because of course the safety, the people coming to work on the base um, was very important. I see at the base XO there, he was master of the snowblower many a morning, <laughs> snowblowing safe sidewalks. That was not in his uh, list Position of chores, <laughs> but he was happy to pitch in. Um, also, I think that the great relationship that the base enjoys with both the city of Groton and the town of Groton, the state of Connecticut, really make the safety issues that come up for families so much easier because there's open communication. Um, there's never um, a lag in the backup from the community. You know, big events happen at the base, the, the carnivals, the, the uh, fireworks, that kind of stuff. And you've got the Groton police out there helping to clear the crowd and be there when that light inevitably stops working at the corner of Crystal Lake at Road. Police officers show up post haste to help direct the traffic there and make sure that it's as safe as possible. And so I think we're blessed in this community that this is a community where you can live and you maybe don't have to lock your door every day and you can feel comfortable and welcome here. And that goes a long way for families who are feeling so emotionally turned mm -hmm. upside down that they feel like they feel settled here and they feel supported here. They feel like it's a quiet town and a lot of people are looking for that respite in their um, ups and downs. The other thing I thought we should mention, we were talking about um, safety and tra is transitioning and the financial piece of that. So mm -hmm. when you, every wife I know has a bucket of curtains, you know, like one of those big made containers. She's got a bucket of curtains and a bucket of blinds and a bucket of shades because she goes from house to house to house and tries to make things work in each location and to prevent buying new every time she goes somewhere. She's the queen of the tension rod and she can make it work in many different ways. And so that, as you can imagine, can add financial stress and strain to a family when you need to put up a fence or take down a fence or buy curtains or, you know, as you go from place to place, a rug here and a rug there. So that is a concern for our families here. and. Um, it's something for you to keep in mind when you're um, gifting away some um, things that are workable in your house to maybe consider taking them to the Navy Marine Corps Lease Society thrift store or maybe even to the Goodwill or putting it on a Craigslist for our Navy friends to um, collect to at a discount. Yes. Um, I would just say very quickly that the advent of cell phones has made a change in one of the vulnerabilities that we used to experience. Our names were always in the local phone book. If you, if you had a landline, there your name was. Uh, at one point, the word kind of went out that it would be better not to have your spouse's rank in that phone book because it made you vulnerable if people were looking to do crank calls or bother you one way or another. Um, we used to have two phone lines back in the day, and one would be one that was published in the phone book. And then one would be one we gave to our friends and family. And so, especially when my it's husband would be deployed, we would mm -hmm. just not answer that line. It would just go to an answering machine. I also had a commanding officer's wife who was writing for the local newspaper, and she got paid by the inch for social news. So my name kept showing up that I had appeared at one thing or another, and my <laughs> students at Fitch would say, hey, I hear you've been out gallivanting. And I thought, you know, this has really got to stop. And I had to finally say, please don't put me in your column anymore. This is, this is getting a little tricky. Um, and the financial safety, one of the nice things that was possible on the uh, boomers was that when the husbands were away, the amount of money that you saved would be given a 10% interest by the federal government. So we very quickly learned to save everything that Mick earned while he was away for three and a half months. And so we had to get kind of proactive there in that first iteration so that we spent, when he was home, only a portion of what he was earning so that I could live on what he was working with. And we discovered uh, on one patrol that we we needed two separate checking accounts because his submarine pulled into Fazlane, Scotland for the first time. Those boomers had never pulled in anywhere when they were away. And I got a phone call from him saying, 
Gee, I hope you have $750 in the checking account, because my sailors needed a little cash to go get a beer. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm, funding, I'm funding the ship to go out on the town. This is great. So at that point, I got myself a separate checking account so that he, could, he knew what he had to spend, and I knew what I had to spend. We're really running through this like crazy, but I think we need to move on to the social-emotional pieces and to sort of explain to you that Maslow's concept of social needs is this, that you recognize people's faces and, and you recognize their names. So for example, when we would have the wives come the first weekend after the submarine left, they'd all pile into my living room uh, and there would be at least a third of the crew knew. Those young wives coming for the first time were terrified we had child care upstairs. Things were pretty loose in those days. Uh, and they would find a place to sit and they'd learn Lisa's name and they'd learn this person's name and you couldn't get them to go get another cup of coffee because they'd lose their seat and they wouldn't know those two people's names. I mean, this, this is very basic friend making um, and it's gonna get you through that three and a half months by seeing the same people every two weeks or so. So just plain knowing people's names, we had a call tree that we were able to make available to everybody, all the spouses on the ship, uh, so that they could call people that they had met and do things in between. Um, this became absolutely imperative when the Scorpion went down and there were wives waiting on the pier for that ship to appear because there hadn't been a call tree that was put out four wives to reach one another and alert them to the fact that, hey, something has gone awry here and you shouldn't be going to the pier. So call trees were possible then. Uh, as years went by, the Privacy Act made that very difficult for us. So the chief of the boat's wife and I would go through all of the names that had been submitted to the command and we'd check out all the phone numbers because I can't tell you how many Joe's bars phone numbers had been listed as his spouse's phone number. And, you know, just for Mick to finally say, hey, you don't have to list a number, but do you want your wife isolated to that extent? That she wouldn't then have the list to call us, and we wouldn't have her phone number to reach her. Do you really want to do that? That's, that's what I call caging your wife, where you preclude her from meeting other people who are living through the same scenario. So the social piece, very important, and because you're all in the same boat, literally, you develop an emotional tie that really can't be matched by good neighbors even, because you are riding that <laughs> same emotional scale through patrol, and there is a very set pattern that you go through, and if somebody ends up being stuck in one of the places and not moving along, then we were savvy enough to say, hey, you know, you need to be reaching the middle part here where things are kind of normal every day and you're not waking up in the middle of the night and worried about your husband. There's something actually called mid-patrol um, and, and it first showed up actually in Vietnam. So it was mid-assignment overseas that in the middle, each of the spouses would end up waking up with a nightmare that something awful had happened to the other. And each one beat himself up about it saying, well, you know, I've been just kind of doing my job, or she thinking, I've just been taking care of the kids or the household, and I've been forgetting to think about him every moment of every day. Well, you do want to get to the point where you're not so worried about that absent spouse that you can't function on a daily basis. But then the interesting thing is, about two weeks before they're due home, the what ifs start. You start saying, what if he doesn't think I look as good as I did when he left? What if he thinks I spent too much money? What if, what if, what if? It, drive yourself nuts. And I will tell you what happens in that scenario. All those sweet young wives who had gotten to know me fairly well 
would be on the phone the night before they were due home. They couldn't sleep, so they thought they'd give me a call. Or one of the gals, I said, why are you, why are you still awake? It's 2 a.m. She said, well, I got my hair done yesterday, and I don't want to ruin it before he gets home. <laughs> you know? But it was just this, this anxiousness about you know, the rearrival that was going to happen. So the social emotional piece is pretty loaded. And it's really helpful if you recognize that the people who are on your same boat are really patterning exactly what you're feeling. Uh, you can kind of look at each other. And we started giving halfway night um, dramas that were absolutely insane and started videotaping them so our husbands could see them when they got home, just so that they'd know that we found out they do halfway nights. We figured if the guys can do halfway nights, so can we. And we put on some things that we would never want to go public, but we thought it was a lot of fun to share it with our sons. <coughs> so my, my experience is kind of straddling what Kathleen had and what, what's going on today. So when we first reported to our first ship in 1990, and we were in Charleston, South Carolina, there was a lot of things the same as what Kathleen had experienced when her husband was in command in the 70s. And there were still halfway night parties, and we made boxes for the guys to take to see. And our experience was two ships that were um, boomers and then three ships that were fast attacks. So we had experience in kind of both realms. And we um, got to know our friends, and our, our, I'll never forget, when we were um, married about, about 10 weeks or so, um, we had been in Charleston, South Carolina, and they, maybe it was about 15 weeks, and um, they invited us to a hail and farewell. I had no idea what this was. And they, we went to this party at the Exo's house, and they welcomed us, and they gave me a little charm bracelet, or a little charm for my bracelet with a ship seal on it. And I thought, wow, this is so great. And I got to know the other women whose husbands were junior officers like mine and were kind of in this intense training period they go to when they first get to their ship. And we kind of went through that whole emotional up and down all the way through what they call the engineer's exam together. And we really got close. And some of those friends were at every one of our change of commands as time went by. And then when we came to be department head wives and then I was the exo's wife, there was a lot more involvement in that kind of social work that Kathleen was talking about, where you were watching out over other wives. You had been over that experience before, and you were there to watch for those, especially new wives who were new to the mix, and making sure that they were making adjustments, or if they weren't making adjustments, reaching out to them and trying to help them as they found their way for what was going to work for them. And then, before we came to become COs the first time around, there was a, there was a revolution called the social networks. And so we went from having these regulated call trees where people had to give you a number and we would call and check all the numbers before the ship went to sea and we would have this hierarchical order to let out information at the appropriate time that would not jeopardize the safety of the ship or its movement orders to then having the local paper, um, people posting it on Facebook, um, it going out um, on, you know, being talked about everywhere that was completely out of the control of the release of the command itself. And that was a big change and a big change in the way the social networks worked on ships. And what we've talked about, Kathleen and I, and one of my biggest fears being a wife now in the Navy is that these social networks where people find their friends and their support through texting, through Facebook, through Instagram, through tweeting, and they're part of larger groups of women called Groton Submarine Wives or, you know, small, or, um, or Submarine Wives Incorporated or, you know, these different groups. And they get on these Facebook pages and they, they share experiences. And in one way, that's really, really helpful. But in another way, it prevents you from having what I would call a front porch neighbor. It prevents you, as we have more and more spouses that are working full time, hanging out with the people in the neighborhood who you live with, getting to know who the good hairdresser is, getting to know where to go buy those, that uniform that you have to have for your child to play soccer, where you go to find you know, the best price on tires. You don't have that group that sits around at the playground in the afternoons after the kids get off the bus anymore. And those front porch neighbors are the neighbors that have two hands to help you when you really, really need them. That front porch neighbor is the neighbor who knows when your kids are sick because they haven't seen your kids outside for three oh, days. Oh, you're sick. 
or when you're sick and your kid is outside in bare feet in the middle of the snow and they know that somebody needs them. And the, for the advent of these social networks, although we have wider groups of people that can comment on the best place to buy tires or the best dentist, we don't have those front porch neighbor who's, neighbors who are those helping hands who catch you when you fall. And as a CEO spouse, it was one of the things that kept me up late at night, wondering where those especially young wives were going to find that friend who was really there to help them and was really there for them. And it's a huge challenge for our Navy going forward because part of the game in the Navy is separation. Your spouse is assigned to a ship, be they male or female now. We have female women on submarines. And they are going to be away. And that is the way it works. And you are going to have to find it in yourself to be independent, even if it's not in your nature. And having a buddy or a friend to help show you the way, or to tell you you're not crazy that you had a crazy <laughs> dream the other night, yeah. is really important. And so it's a huge issue, and it's an issue that I worry about for the young wives coming forward, and how we as a social emotional support community can reach out to them and be those actual physical hands, those front porch neighbors who know you and know your patterns and know that your four-year-old shouldn't be outside at five o'clock at night by themselves and, ca and bring them to the house. I remember one time we were living in housing and I was in the shower. And at that time in housing, there were these big awning windows and no ventilation in the bathroom. So you had to open the window every time you showered, whether it was you know, <laughs> snowing or whatever. Now I grew up in Buffalo, so that was okay. But some of my friends were really <laughs> having a hard time. And um, I'm in the shower and I hear my neighbor, hello, are you in the shower? Are you in the shower? So I had had at that point three children and I had the baby and the infant, the toddler and the baby, in napping in the middle of the day and I'm like, oh good, I'll have a shower. I'll like actually wash my hair because nobody's gonna bother me. And my five-year-old had let himself out of the house and was wandering around the neighborhood. And my neighbor knew that that was most unusual and she caught him and went and he had locked the door behind him. That's when we had those locking doors and housing that would lock when they closed shut behind you. I see several people nodding, they remember those. And, um, and so she came to the bathroom window and was shouting in the bathroom window, I have him. And she goes, oh no, no, finish. You don't ever get on after after shower. I'll just take him to my house. You come get him when you're done. And those are the things that I worry about our young wives and our new wives to the Navy, new husbands to the Navy, having that social emotional connection. Yeah. We are getting close to where we want to be, and we haven't touched the sort of upper end of Maslow's hierarchy. And I guess I'd kind of like to clump the intellectual, the aesthetic, and the spiritual together just say I think it's terribly important for spouses uh, and husbands as well um, and you see what I'm doing because we're so used to spouses being female and husbands being male um, to find a way to continue their education to take opportunities as they present themselves to take risks for employment of varying sorts I spent a wonderful semester right here at UConn Avery Point teaching after I'd finished my master's degree. Had freshman English, two sections, ages 18 to 81. Let me tell you, that's an experience to have that kind of breadth and yet also the freedom to totally develop the curriculum. What a lovely gift to give a, a young Navy wife that, that opportunity. So, Continuing to invest in ourselves may sound selfish at first wash, but you know, we're the people who turn around and do the research on the lifestyle that we have. We can't wait for somebody who doesn't understand it because he or she hasn't lived it to do that kind of work. And so a lot of the work with military families has been done by military family members and at the Family Service Center. I believe deeply in spouse employment and worked very hard to, to find employees who had had this experience so that when people walked through our door, they knew that that person they were meeting with understood where they were coming from. So continue to invest in your education Find some kind of aesthetic outlet. Mine happens to be music. Believe it or not, I'm still a little boy soprano at this age and love it. 
It has gotten me through more uh, stressful scenarios throughout my life to either be able to sit at my piano for hours and just forget that, you know, it's snowing outside in downtown Mystic and there's going to have to be shoveling tomorrow. <laughs> you, to be able to find an outlet is a terribly important piece. And the final part of that, which I want Lisa to jump in on as well, is the spiritual piece of it. I think we often tend to shy away from talking about that part of our lives. But I have watched students say how important it is to them to know that God knows where they are, no matter where they move. God knows where I'm living. You know, our, our kids' version of that when they're little is, how will Santa find me in this new house? And then as they get a little more mature, it goes from Santa to God, which is probably a good direction. Um, I happen to be at Mystic Congregational Church in Mystic. Um, it allows me a freedom not to buy into an endless creed, but to attempt to live a Christian life. That's about as wide open as you can possibly be. Uh, and, and it makes the work that I do um, part of the way in which I live my faith. Um, I will tell you that some of those scary nights when um, a peeping Tom was looking through the window in our mystic house, um, until the police arrived, and it was yet another kid I had taught in high school who's now a policeman. That's great. Um, it's just, it's important to have something that you can hold on to wherever you are. Um, and Lisa, I'll let you jump in on that. I, I think it also helps our children and our families have stability because it's predictable. And they know what to expect, at least in that one area of their life. Um, <clears throat> my husband and I are, are members of Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is otherwise known as the Mormon Church. And it's pretty standard across the whole wide world. And my kids really appreciated knowing that on Tuesday night was going to be young men, young women, and scouts night, no matter pretty much wherever they moved. And there was always going to be a place for them there. It offered them that stability and that predictability and that opportunity to grow and to chart their growth and to set those goals. Um, we have one son who's served a full-time mission for our church and another son who's kind of in the process of getting there um, and have several more sons and daughters to come along. Um, but it's also a uniting factor. You know, we talked earlier about the family dinner. And whatever your religious background, that ritual for my Jewish friends of having Shabbat every Friday night, and their kids know that that is going to be the way it is every single Friday night, whether daddy's there or not. Mm -hmm. Having a family dinner, as your kids get older, having a family dinner every night just doesn't work. But knowing that on Monday nights is going to be the night, or Sunday afternoon is going to be the day that we spend together. Or we're going to go to Friday night mass, if that's the tradition in your Catholic family. Friday night at, you know, I live in Gales Ferry. Friday night at 645, you can just see the cars coming in to Our Lady of Lord's Church. And that's regular and predictable and supportive of our children and our families. And so whatever your faith tradition is very important to carry that with you as you go from place to place to place because that gives you stability and it grounds you when your spouse is away and you're confronting the peeping Tom or the teenage meltdown or the knocking out of the front teeth or whatever else is happening in your children's lives or your lives. That gives you that stability to grow forward, to set goals, to maintain routines, because that's really what our kids need. They need routine. They need to know in an unpredictable life what is predictable. And that's how our kids are happy and sane. You know, I think that I can honestly say for my 22 and 20 year old son, and they have actually even written me letters, I have saved them, to say things like, you know what I realize now that I left home? I had a great childhood. I had a childhood full of exploring and, and it, museums and events and you know meeting astronauts because of my dad's job and understanding what that whistle means when you hear it come up the, up the, the themes and you hear those whistles coming up the themes because you know someone's coming home from deployment. And babysitting kids in the family readiness group and all the things that go with being a military kid, the good and the bad. And my kids are a tight group. They call themselves the six pack. <laughs> and they are a tight, tight group. 
And that's a benefit of being a military family because your best friend has to be your siblings because that's who's always with you. And so that social, emotional, that intellectual growth, that, that spiritual growth is so important. And really we as parents, the parent who's home, have to manage that and have to be guarding out for that and laying the ground rules as we move and looking to the next place to set those rules ahead of time. Well, we've raced through Navy Life 101, and we thought it would be fun to hear from you all if you have questions or if you have comments. So, do you want to repeat the Yeah, question? sure. So he asked about what do we do for the single sailors who are aboard our ships whose families are not in the area or who may not even have a parent still living even that has particularly close to a great aunt or, you know, someone back home. And I can say that back in the in the, the 90s, we used to address that through the boat newsletter. And it used to go out once a month, and it would be mailed to whoever the sailor asked that the newsletter be mailed to. And now, with the advent of technology, and we have like Facebook pages for the ship, and you get in, it's a closed group, and you can add those families in. Many times during our executive officer tour and our commanding officer tours on the ships, we had families travel to be there for homecoming, and they were included in all the homecoming planning. Um, they would attend the, like, the night before party. We would make sure that they had access to the base. We would work with the squadron to make sure all IDs and, and things that needed to be checked to allow them access to the pier would be in line for them to attend. We'd partner them up with a wife who had room in her car to meet them off base and bring them on base and get them to all those uh, places so they could be with their sailor. And so, yes, and I think in Kathleen's experience in the 70s when she was saying about 60 or 80 percent of the crew was married, mm -hmm. I think now it's almost flipped and about 60 percent, 50 percent of the crew is unmarried. And so that's a way that in the more recent time we've been reaching out to those families in distant locations to help them feel connected. And one of the best things for, in my experience, was how generous those families were. So when we would say we're trying to raise money for a kid's halfway party for all the small children at Chuck E. Cheese or at the swimming pool on base, boy, those parents were so uh, generous. And in would come the 10 and 15 and $20 checks from all those parents. And it would make it possible for the young families to have a little, little way to get out. And so we really felt a closeness with those people, even though they weren't right in our area. So the question is about um, the religious retreats available on base and, and the effectiveness. I have to be a little careful in how I respond to that. The chaplains run those programs, and I think that they are very careful to select the appropriate couples to attend. I think if, the, if there are major issues afoot, that may or may not be an appropriate setting. But for, for most of us, it's a really nice experience to just kind of have a way time to really focus on each other and the changes that are going on in our lives and our perspectives. Something new in the Navy community, too, is a co program called Compass. And it's designed mm -hmm. to let new spouses be learn from experienced spouses and they do like kind of little training modules so like one is on your pay and another one is on benefits and another one is on using the commissary another one is on strategies to survive deployment and they kind of, it's a two-day workshop um, child care is provided the uh, teachers are more senior spouses people have been spouses at least three years and then at least one full deployment cycle but often there are people more like me who have been doing it over 20 years and have been stopped counting deployment cycles um, and those are that's an important way that we can serve those families coming in even if it's that one is not designed for both active duty and spouse it's really designed for the spouses um, but that is a way that we can reach it we are reaching out to um, communities and that are new people who are new to our community and then there's also this thing online called Navy One Source and that's been great for those parents that are away from the base because they can type in on Navy One Source what's a deployment what's a halfway <laughs> night what should I expect at homecoming and this Navy One Source search engine will bring up resources for them and so that's a way to reach out to those more distant families um, but still, the best way is to make those connections on your boat 
with people, because I'm sure that's how it helped you guys back in the day, is you made friends. You made friends who were in your same position and who maybe were a little ahead and could warn you to the pitfalls. My husband is laughing behind over your shoulder. Um, so, you know, I have six children. So, like, this is a big issue. And, for, and, and the question was, the, the husband coming home, how do you reintegrate, how do reintegrate? Yes. into the family that has now been running on all cylinders with one parent? So um, one of the things that worked for us was to keep the rules consistent. And sometimes dad needs to be trained on like, okay, there's three simple rules. When my kids were little, they were all babies wear diapers, all children ride in car seats, and all children obey their parents. Three simple rules that cover just about everything. And then there were consequences that went along with breaking the rules. And there was a marble jar that you got for doing a good job. And so what my husband did is he learned the system. And so he would come home, and he would know there was some kind of weirdness about, like, you know, who is this guy? Especially at different develop developmental ages and stages, it can be very frightening to small children, toddlers, having dad come in and out. And first thing to, as dad is to expect that and to know that it's not... Um, a reflection on how much you love and care for your child, but more a reflection at their developmental age and stage, and that they are so identified and so close to their mom. And it's not that they don't want to be with you. It's just that that's where they are. Um, and then to learn the system that's working for mom and be a co-parent in that system. Mm -hmm. Don't try to change the system. Don't try to be like, well, a new sheriff's in town, because that does not work. <laughs> Children need stability, predictability, and you know they need to be able to know that things are going to stay the same. And I will add that that goes for canine and feline children. And I'm told equine. I do have a friend who has a horse. Um, that you know, like you can't say to the dog, "Oh, well, you know, we don't ever play after nine o'clock at night." But I'm home. Let's go out and play. Because then the next time you have duty at nine thirty, she's going to be like, oh, "We've been over this. We don't go out after nine o'clock and throw the ball. We do it, you know, when it's day. so." It, it even applies to canine and equine children feline children, <laughs> you need to like meet before you leave, decide what like kind of the, the, the rule, basic rule plan is gonna be, so that as you come in and out, you can be on the same team. And I will add to that, that I think, I think it's a waltz when you come home. Yep. Um, each of the partners has changed during that period of time. You've both had experiences that are um, challenging in many ways, and um, each of you hopes you have done what the other will perceive as the right action one way or another. Often part of that is financial. Um, so I used, I used to find that it was helpful. Mick needed to sleep the first three days he was home. And the kids, Heather would go and pull his eye up and say, Dad, are you in there? Because he was so exhausted. But after he's been home for several days, I would take him to the commissary and let him pick out the food he wanted. And of course, I discovered that he was sick and tired of lobster and steak. Oh, poor you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. Submariners eat pretty well. And then we would slowly go over the checkbook just to kind of say where some of the unexpected pieces had been. And that opens the door for other unexpected experiences. And I think it's just sort of a slow sharing with each other. But if you're on a schedule like a lot of the boats are, you don't have the luxury of a lot of time, you know, for doing that. So you have to learn to trust mm -hmm. and risk and also to and speak what's your mind. That's Don't right. wait for your spouse to guess what's going on. You need to learn to just say what the problem is. Because if you try to wait for them to guess, they might be gone before they finally <laughs> figure it out. You know, some, some years ago, um, there was a special study done here at the base, and it was the only Navy installation that participated in it. Um, and we discovered that when he added up the time that a sailor did not have his head on his own pillow was about 11 months of the year. And those 30 days that he was home were, were not consecutive days.
Right. And there will be times in your life aboard a fast attack that you will have a year like that. Yeah. They just come every once in a while. And you have to work on your communication skills, which is, that's why I'm so grateful someone asked about the retreats. Because that's really what those are designed to do, is to work on your communication skills between the two of you. So that when you have three days, and you're probably both only conscious and awake for a couple of hours of those three days, that there aren't kids and work and other responsibilities, that your communication between the two of you is at the point where you can debrief it quick enough that you can come to a quick meeting of the minds and know what the next couple of weeks and months is going to look like. Thank you.